Welcome back to Shannon's Club TV, the show for all motoring enthusiasts to share our passion for road and race cars in Australia. There's a huge selection of past episodes available anytime on the Shannon's Club website, along with the full road and race stories by Mark and me. Now coming up, we'll get a market update from the Shannon's auctions team and meet a proud owner of our feature car. Now let's have a look at the last and arguably most interesting model of the first generation Holden Commodores, the VL. The VL, which made its debut in February 1986, was the last of the compact, relatively narrow Commodores. Holden's designers had made a significant change with the VK two years earlier by adding two extra rear side windows. But a bigger glass house only went so far towards alleviating customer perceptions that the Holden was too small inside compared with the Falcon and even the clever new Mitsubishi Magna. Holden was stuck with the existing platform until 1988, but had given it a major mechanical revamp. Finally, the dear old red Holden 6s had been consigned to the past, their place beneath the bonnet taken by a fantastic new single overhead camshaft straight six produced by Nissan, destined to power a new Skyline still some months from being launched locally. Nissan's equally brilliant four-speed electronic automatic transmission was also a huge improvement over the outgoing Trimatic. Buyers who wanted a manual transmission got a Holden 5-speeder, which was much better than the old four-speed unit fitted to early Commodores. Mark, did the VL Commodore in Group A racing differ greatly from its VK predecessor? Well, initially, no, with the last of the Holden dealer team developed Group A Commodores. You know, it, mechanically, it was very similar to the VK in having the last of the carburetor-fed Holden V8s, the Getrag five-speed gearbox, the core sprung live rear axle, and the body kit was really just a mild evolution of the VK as well. The big change for VL in racing, though, came much later with a new Group A car developed by Holden Special Vehicles, which I'll get to a bit later on. But changes to the suspension were less successful, and the VL felt noticeably less sharp than the VB original. Essentially, the first model's rear roll steer had been traded for excessive understeer, perhaps better for Joe and Jane average punter, but not for the enthusiast driver. The optional FE2 suspension fixed the handling at the expense of a hard ride. Unfortunately, the Commodore's biggest negatives, one perceived, one real, had still not been fixed. The narrow cabin remained as a disadvantage to be exploited by rivals, but was really an issue for owners, while build quality and finish remained poor to abject. With VL, the styling changes were almost as major as those of the VK. The Calais got a unique nose cone with semi-retractable headlights. The turbocharged version of the Nissan 6 turned a VL Calais into a truly desirable performance sedan even while Holden fought for its corporate life behind the scenes. Mark, the VL Commodore certainly enjoyed some great racetrack success, didn't it? Yeah, particularly at Bathurst, and it had Peter Brock and Tom Walkinshaw to thank for that. Holden's VL Commodore holds the unique distinction of winning two Bathurst 1000s during the Group A era with its homegrown 4.9 litre V8. It also won those races in two distinctly different configurations, influenced by opposing race teams during the most turbulent era in Holden's motorsport history. The first win came in 1987 for the VL SS Group A, the last Commodore designed and built with input from Peter Brock and his HDT Special Vehicles operation. It was a win against the odds, as the infamous split between Holden and HDT that year had left Brock out in the cold and with limited resources for Bathurst. Somehow, the cash-strapped team fronted with two Group A Commodores, and after an early engine failure in Brock's car, he and co-driver David Parsons switched to Peter McLeod's backup car, which was not expected to go the distance. Somehow, it did, and its third place became first, after the two works Ford Sierras that finished 1-2 were excluded after the race on technical grounds. John, that 1987 win for Brocky, that must have really increased the collectability of HDT's 
last Group A car, you know, given at the time there was all the cynicism about Brock and the polarizer, and it, it sort of it sort of damp put a dampener over the whole HDT brand for for a while. Eh? Yes, it did. But I think with the passing of the decades, as so often happens, the the acrimony dissipates. Yeah, and uh, we sort of treasure those cars as part of that era, really. And even in terms of collectability, now the. Uh, the, the plus pack Commodores, which were the ones fitted with Brocky's polarizer, and they're... his signature. <laughs> and his he signature. wouldn't sign the other ones. No, they're considered more valuable. Well, it's uh, understandable. So yeah. Bathurst, uh, yeah. massively influential as always on the collectability, of especially cars. when the name P. Brock's involved. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The VL second Bathurst win came three years later with another iteration called the VL SS Group A SV, developed in partnership with UK-based Tom Walkinshaw Racing. It featured a tougher and more efficient fuel-injected V8 and a radical wind tunnel tuned body kit designed to reduce drag and increase downforce. The new Walkinshaw Group A failed to deliver on debut at Bathurst in 1988 and it was totally outclassed by turbocharged rivals again the following year. For 1990 though, Holden was given a fighting chance thanks to weight penalties imposed on turbo cars to level the playing field. The Holden Racing Team responded with a fast and tough Bathurst package designed to push the turbo cars to breaking point. The aggressive strategy worked, allowing Wynne Percy and Alan Grice to power home to a popular win as their turbo rivals fell all around them. With two Bathurst wins in four years, the mighty VL Commodore SS Group A in both HDT and TWR forms ranks as one of Holden's greatest Bathurst race cars. Remember, you can build your own virtual garage on the Shannon's Club website. Yeah, g'day. My name's Rod Hanson from Shannon's Auctions in Melbourne. And here we have a walk and VL Commodore. This car has not been changed since it left the factory. It's completely original, right down to the front spoiler, which a lot of people remove because it's very low. It's running original paint, original trim, very, very good condition, very lovely car. This particular car was first registered on the 23rd of June, 1989 in Queensland, and it's only had two owners since then. On the clock, it's showing about 130,000 kilometres from you. The Walkinshaws were the first of the twin throttle body fuel injected V8 engines. Running a five speed gearbox, very, very nice car to drive. In the late 80s, when Walkinshaw took over the, the HDT or the HSV and went to HSV in the late 80s, they campaigned this car in Australian Touring Car Championship. I can remember when these cars first hit the streets. Totally something you've never seen before. The massive rear spoilers, spoilers around the whole car. Very, very cool. Tiny Hanson from the Shannon's Auctions team joins us to talk about the huge VL Commodore range. Welcome to the show, mate. Thanks, Mark. How are you going? Welcome, Tiny. Hey, it really does cover a multitude oh. of sins, that term VL Commodore, doesn't it? It's I mean, huge. It's sure. Yeah, it's a big you know, range. You've got, you got sedans, you've got wagons, you've got that beautiful Calais. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you've got uh, the high-performance models. The Holden Dealer Team Joint Developed Group A. And then the car, the HSV or Walkinshaw Walk Group. Yeah. So you've got these two racing variants as well. It's, it's, it's a lot of cars to choose from. There are a lot of cars to choose from. And um, obviously on top of the range would be the VL, the Group A. Yeah. If you get a plus pack with the polarizer. That's, that's the HDT that's, that's car. That's the HDT yeah. car. And then you've got the beautiful Walkinshaw with all those spoilers. And so they call them the Tupperware, the which, Tupperware car. <laughs> which so. is the more desired by collectors? Yeah. Two different markets. Yes, I, I think I reckon there's yeah. two different markets. There's one that wants the HDT car. And the other group of market want the walk and shore car. Yeah. And then there's no connection between them. You're either a Brock man or a exactly walk and shore right. man. Exactly right. That's 100% correct. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah. And uh, I mean, there's so many different models in there. Don't forget, this was 
the VL that brought in the Nissan 6. The Nissan and 6. then, of course, the Nissan Turbo 6, which that engine was phenomenal. Right. I mean, that had more power than a lot of V8s. Well, they used that in the um, a lot of the police intercept cars. Highway Patrol. Highway Patrol cars, the yeah. yellow ones, if you remember, the canary yellow cars. Yep. Very so, fast cars. So does that increase the desirability of a VL today? Because that engine was so smooth compared to a Holden engine's... Yes. Oh, the, tur the Turbo Six is very, 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 very popular car to have. Yes. Very popular with, especially with the younger set. Mm -hmm. um, very popular car. Yes. And I particularly loved the VL Calais mm. with that beautiful front, and it was a yep. really stunning it's looking semi -retractable car. Semi-retractable headlights, semi -retractable headlights. 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 I mean, that must yeah. be quite a collectible now. Very collectible it? car, and a beautiful driving position. When you open the mm. door of a VL and you jump in, you actually fall down into the car. Yeah. And, and you, once you're in, you're like you're in an armchair. It's a yes. great, little, great driving position. And what would be the most desirable? Would that be the, the V8 version or the Turbo 6 version? In a Calais, it doesn't really matter, I'd I say suppose. in a Calais, I would, I would think the V8 version. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So if someone's looking for a, a VL Commodore as a collectible, I think you've, you've established the pecking order for us. Do you start at the Group A cars and then and work, work your way, way down, down yeah, in terms of value? Down. For sure. I'll yeah. say, yeah. What about just your, your basic VL executive mm. sedan or wagon? Yeah, you they, still see them on the roads today. They're, they're still around. Bit being, of collector being interest. Yeah, but they're still driving on normal rego, getting yeah. driven around backwards and forwards oh, to work. They're still out there. And just one more point when we're talking about the HDT Group A car, a small number of those were called Plus Pack because they had the, the polarizer, the, the controversial yes, energy polarizer. Energy polarizer. Um, now, regardless of whether that worked or not, or what people think about it, does that make that car more valuable? Yes, it does. It, it just pops it up, just set into the next level. And what, why is that? Because that had Brocky's personal imprint on. He was so he was so well, passionate about this device. It had his signature on it too, yeah. and less of them. He wouldn't produced. sign the other cars. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Too. Mm. Yeah, right. Yeah, so regardless of the fact that General Motors rejected it, it still, it still makes happened. it more desirable. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, interesting yeah. stuff. Mm, Thanks, is. Tiny. No worries. And remember, you can keep up to date with all the latest Shannon's Auctions news on the Shannon's Club website. If you'd like your own image of the VL Commodore in competition, visit autopix.com.au. John, it's interesting looking back at the VL Commodore, you know, uh, with the competition they were having from Falcon at the time and the perception that the Commodore was too small, I think Holden engineers did a pretty good job over those five different models in, in making the Commodore seem bigger than it was. Well, they had five models, mm. basically, while the Falcon had three, and they made big changes and it created the perception of it being a much lighter area car with more space inside. They mm. were very, very ingenious, yeah. the Holden designers, I think. And then, of course, they did go to a really big Commodore with the VN. They did, mm. yes. Yeah, interesting time in uh, Holden history. Well, we hope you've enjoyed reflecting on the last of the first generation Holden Commodores, and we look forward to your company next time on Shannon's Club TV. Bye for now.